Today is July 28, 2016, and I am interviewing Dr. Shivanda Jacobs-Young, who is the administrator for USDA's Agricultural Research Service. We are in Washington, D.C., in USDA's Creative Media and Broadcast Center. I'm Susan Fugate. I'm head of Special Collections at the National Agricultural Library, and I've worked for USDA for almost 40 years. So to begin, if you would state your full name and spell it, please. Shavonda Jacobs-Young, C-H-A-V-O-N-D-A, J-A-C-O-B-S hyphen Y-O-U-N-G. If you could start with sharing with us some biographical information, and you can go back as far as you'd like. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm from Augusta, Georgia and the child of a military man and a re registered nurse. And um, I grew up right outside of Gate 5 on the original Tobacco Road <laughs> there in Georgia. And so what you can take from that is that I don't have a huge history in agriculture. So I did not grow up on a farm. Um, but I did grow up as a student of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, I had a lot of opportunities in high school to prepare for an engineering in STEM. And um, I dreamed of one day going out into the world and becoming an engineer. And so um, I left Augusta, Georgia, and I went to North Carolina State University on a Pulp and Paper Foundation scholarship. Uh, you're probably asking, what is pulp and paper? <laughs> I was asking the same thing. <laughs> and so it's very interesting to have this opportunity to go and major in something that, um, I, first of all, I had never heard of before I went to an interest meeting at our local paper mill. But secondly, to also have the support from the foundation. I was an athlete in high school, so um, one probably would have assumed that I would have gone on to do um, athletics in college, but I was just focused on becoming an engineer, so I was prepared to go to Georgia Tech and major in engineering, and, and, and life would be good. And, and then the Pulp and Paper Foundation came along and invited me to an interest meeting. And uh, so I decided to give it a try. And, and long story short, I ended up in North Carolina State University, majoring in something called pulp and paper science and uh, on, on a scholarship. And that was the most important part of it, was an opportunity to have my education supported. And so I was very excited about that. Uh, luckily, at North Carolina State University, I also had an opportunity to complete, to, to continue my um, athletics. And so um, between my academic scholarships and my athletic scholarships, I was able to be at North Carolina State and successfully um, complete the program. Now, pulp and paper science and technology is only offered at eight universities in the country at that time. I'm sure it's less now. And for me to not know what it was, but then to find out that it was a very, very exciting area of science um, that was also engineering. And most students can go along in five years, have an undergraduate degree in paper science and engineering, and have a chemical engineering degree within five years. And I uh, decided to continue my education and went straight through, which most students don't do. I completed the P BS, the MS, and then I completed the PhD in paper science and engineering. And so with that, um, becoming the first African American in the country to earn a PhD in paper science and engineering. So I went from not knowing what it was to actually becoming the first African American PhD in the country. Uh, I luckily had a job offer before I finished my PhD and I went to the University of Washington in Seattle to um, be a professor, an assistant professor of paper science and engineering at the University of Washington. And I was there for about six and a half years on a tenure track faculty position and uh, lo and behold decided to leave the University of Washington and come to the Department of Agriculture. And um, a lot of people asked, you know, are you crazy? Who, you know, nobody leaves a tenure track faculty position. You know, what are you thinking? You know, um, and for me, it was just an amazing opportunity. Um, I had been, I'm from the East Coast. It was an opportunity to go back to the East Coast. And I had this passion for science, always have. Um, I think I got my first chemistry set at like age eight. And I think my mom still has it somewhere in the house with the microscope and all of the opportunities to do little experiments. I've always been excited about science. This move to the Department of Agriculture allowed me not to only um, continue to um, 
grow my career, but it allowed me to stay close to science. And so instead of being at the bench, I was able to help secure resources for scientists who continued to want to be at the bench. And so I joined something, an agency called the Cooperative State Research Education and Extension Service, which is now NIFA. So, so that's how I ended up here at the Department of Agriculture. Now, you've shared some of this, but can you talk a little bit more about some of the things that influenced your education choices and um, also talk about your experience in executive leadership in public policy implementation at American University? Absolutely. So once I joined um, the Department of Agriculture, I was a GS-13 national program leader, and I couldn't have been more excited. It was just a very, very exciting time in my career for me. Um, and it was very early on, I think about two months in, um, someone came to a, a staff meeting and announced that they were going to have a Senior Executive Service Candidate Development Program. And I was a brand new national program leader, but I just thought, wow, that sounds very, very exciting. And, um, and so it, that just stuck with me. And I remember people in, around the room saying, oh, you know, didn't show a lot of interest in it. But I thought, why wouldn't someone want to be a senior executive service member? If that's the ultimate, then why aren't you shooting for that? You know, and I remember just thinking that as a, as a, a, new, a young new employee. And so doing my first, my first uh, mid-year review with my new supervisor, I told him, I said, I want to be senior executive service in five years. Immediately, I was embarrassed. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, you know. I said, no, no, don't write that down. Don't write that down. And he says, no, let's write it down. And let's talk about how we get you there. So let's talk about what you should be doing in those five years to prepare yourself. And um, so it started there, 2002, brand new GS-13 national program leader, just really thinking about how to make my trek to the senior executive service. Um, not, letting that, not letting that drive my everyday decisions, but certainly with a goal in mind. And, um, and so when my turn came along in 2007 to apply to the senior executive service program, five years, <laughs> interesting that it happened that way, um, I had an opportunity to apply to the SES CDP, and I was accepted. And so here comes the, the hard part. And um, so I, part of that program is getting the, the, the coursework completed at the American University. And of course, originally you think, oh my gosh, this is going to take a lot of time, and it's a lot of time away from work, and it's on top of work. You don't get to stop your job. You have to do this on top of everything else. And I had young kids at the time just wondering, how am I going to make this happen? I look back now and I still wonder, how did I make that happen? But the, the coursework in public policy implementation at American University turned out to be the largest gift I've received in my career. It was an opportunity to really reflect on being a great leader, finding out what my strengths are, where my opportunities for improvement, and overall just figuring out how I wanted to present myself as a leader going forward. And uh, we talked about policy, we talked about laws, and so it was just a great opportunity to get an overall, overall overview of what it meant to be a leader in the public sector, and so it was a great opportunity for me. And so completing that program, along with my cohort of 74 other um, leaders inside the Department of Agriculture and across the federal government, created a, 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 a real safety net for me. I still have colleagues that I call and we stay in touch, and so, as we all find our way through this senior executive service opportunity, these senior executive service opportunities, it's been really great to have them. And we were, we were certified at a point, a real critical point for the Department of Agriculture. There were a lot of leadership opportunities vacant. So many of us went from being certified to immediately thrust into uh, significant leadership roles. So there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, an opportunity to enter the shallow end of the pool. <laughs> it was literally being thrown in the deep end. And uh, so it was nice to have other people who were going through the same thing and all of us really supporting each other through that. Um, it was at that time um, through the SES CDP that I had to choose a detail opportunity. And I talked to my senior executive member at the time, my, um, my senior executive deputy administrator, and I said, she and I talked, and I said, I have to pick a detail. And she says, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to go to the White House. And she said, okay, 
let's make that happen. And uh, she knew someone who had worked at the White House, and she worked with that individual. She says, we're going to get in touch with her. And she worked with that individual, and she helped me get an interview at the White House at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And um, after three interviews, I was accepted to be able to join that team as a senior advisor for agriculture in OSTP. And that was an amazing experience as well. And so that was a, an opportunity to be a part of the transition. So I was there at the last year of um, President Bush's administration and at the beginning of President Obama's administration. So to be at the White House during that time was a very special opportunity to really see, um, to see this transition from a different perspective. Um, to be able to help um, ramp down the one administration and help with the ramp up of the other. So it was a time of, um, it was a time of really seeing the rebirth of science in the administration. Uh, this, this administration came in with a bang. Uh, one of the first appointees was the, the, the science advisor, Dr. John Holdren, who was the science advisor to the president. You know, so we already had an idea that science was going to be a huge part of this administration. So it was just a very, very exciting time. And uh, so I had an opportunity to work with, um, work with Dr. Holdren and the team. And then I came back to USDA to work with Do Dr. Rod Shaw, who was our undersecretary. And um, he was uh, not your typical undersecretary for REE. He was a medical doctor. That's the first thing that made him very, very different. And he was under the age of 35. So here's this guy who had just a different way of doing things, a different way of looking at things. He was energetic. He was motivating. He was not your typical ag person. And so it was very exciting to come and work with him as a part of his team. And I think. Um, he had some real big plans for us. And it was at that time that we were transforming uh, CSREES, the Cooperative State Research Education Extension Service, into NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And when we transformed it to, uh, to NIFA, it was more than just a name change. It was a transformation. And so I was charged with then our communications director, Rick Borchelt, to lead the rollout of the um, of, of NIFA. And so the in individuals inside CSREES had worked very, very hard to put all the pieces into place. And so we wanted to have this very public rollout of NIFA. And it had to be big. It had to be, um, it had to illustrate how transformative this change was going to be. And so we worked with the team across REE and we invited just some of the best names in science to come and talk about how important NIFA was going to be to the scientific enterprise across government. And we had Dr. Holdren himself who came. Uh, we had the Secretary of Agriculture. We had Rod Shaw. We had, we just had amazing, amazing people. Sally Rocky from NIH, just an amazing portfolio of diversity of people across the federal government. And we then announced a brand new leader for NIFA. This leader was now a six-year political appointee. So the head of NIFA is, was a political appointee, whereas in CSREES it was a career civil servant. And so this six-year appointee, this was the first person who would lead NIFA. And so we rolled out um, Dr. Roger Beachy, who was the new director of NIFA. Very, very exciting time. I was at the press club and people were just a buzz. It was just, it, it was big and it was exciting and it was, um, it was encouraging for, for the outlook. And so that was a, that was a great time. Um, I was very, very excited about that opportunity. And shortly thereafter, Dr. Shaw left and he went to USAID. So I think it was maybe less than six months in. I'm not sure how long he was here, but it wasn't very long. Uh, and then we had this nine-month waiting period until we had our new undersecretary, Dr. Catherine Wotecki, who's been amazing. And um, during that time, I was charged by the secretary and the secretary's office to stand up the office of the chief scientist. So as a part of the Farm Bill, we created the position of the chief scientist. And that is the REE undersecretary, um, serves in both of those roles. 
But the chief scientist did not have the supporting infrastructure of, of an office. And so I had an opportunity to create this office, working with people across the department, um, put in some of the original language to sort of put the structure around it. That office is still in existence today, still evolving, still growing. Um, so it's a very, it was a very exciting time. So it just was, um, it was a time of seeing the integration of science and how we did everything. And it was just a really, really exciting time. I'm going to stop there. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the story of how you came to be appointed as the administrator for the Agricultural Research Service? Absolutely. So um, Dr. Wotecki became our undersecretary, and I was working with her as the director of the Office of the Chief Scientist. And um, shortly thereafter, Dr. Roger Beattie announced that he was leaving. And it was a surprise because um, I, don't, I don't believe he had been here. I, I don't know if it was a year or the time escapes me. But so Dr. Wotecki um, called me down to her office one day. And she said, you know, I have something to tell you. And she says, well, uh, Dr. Beachy is leaving. And I said, oh, my. You know, that was a very, very big surprise for me. <laughs> um, and she says, and I want you to act <laughs> in his role until we can, the president can appoint a new person. And I thought, well, that's two things. <laughs> and that second one is a doozy. <laughs> you know, that's, that's big. That's huge. Um, and I, I remember coming back upstairs in, in the Witten building and sitting at my desk thinking, oh my gosh, this is huge to be responsible for NIFA, you know, this, this trans transformed agency with these new directions and new, you know, new agendas and new initiatives. Um, um, but remembering that I had, I had and I still have a sincere love for NIFA. It's where I got my start in USDA. and. Um, the work that's done in that agency is so critically important. And I thought to myself, well, you can do this. You can do this. And so I served, uh, it was supposed to be 122 days. And the president was going to appoint a new person, and all would be well with the world. I'd go back to my director of the office chief science job, and we'd all live happily ever after. Well, it was, over, it was a, just about a year. <laughs> it turned out to be just over, just a little under a year as I, when I served as the acting NIFA director. And um, when Dr. Sunny Ramaswamy was appointed as the NIFA director, I went back to my position as the director of the Office of the Chief Scientist. And it was just about that time Dr. Judy St. John at ARS announced that she was retiring. And, um, and it, there was now an opportunity in ARS. And um, it was interesting to me because although we were sister agencies, I still did not have a uh, um, a sincere familiarity with the agency. I didn't know ARS very well. So when we met, with, had a lot of meetings about the move, um, to me I saw it as an exciting opportunity to come and learn a new agency. NIFA is a tiny agency. It has, uh, um, the budget is larger than ARS, but the agency is very small. It's less than 400 people. So to move to an agency like ARS, you know, 8,000 employees, 90 locations, four overseas locations, it's just it's night and day in terms, of, um, in terms of the structure. So I thought it was an exciting time to come to ARS and have this opportunity under Dr. Nippling's leadership to learn the agency and working with Dr. Caird, Rex Road, and all of the other uh, leadership within the agency. So I moved to, to ARS in 2012 as Associate Administrator for National Programs, responsible for all of the research programs in, um, in ARS. And it was, it was a learning experience. It was a great experience. And I can tell you, even today, every day I learn something new about ARS, it gets me even more excited about being a part of it. Um, and so I had this opportunity to learn the agency. And I was settling in, and it all was going well. And then Dr. Nippling announced that he was retiring. <laughs> what is with the retirements here? You know, so I was like, no, not yet. I need more time. I want to learn more about the agency. There's so much more to learn, you know. And so it was at that time, it was late 2013, where I had to decide if I was going to apply for the administrative position or not. It was a competitive search, so there wasn't an appointment. Um, it was a competitive search, an open search for the administrative position. So I made a decision to apply. And so I competed for the job, and um, 
and I was appointed in February 2014. And so, much to my surprise, to be honest, I really was very, very surprised um, because I didn't know what direction the department wanted to go in. Because it, the, peop, the, the people who were the front runners for the position, we all brought different things to the table. And so I, I suppose that I wondered for the department, you know, what direction did they want to go in for the agency? And so when I was selected, I was just, um, I guess I was just, hopeful that, you know, that the, the message was we want to see ARS moving forward and going into to new, new directions. And so um, I was pointed in February 2014. Good story. Um, next I'd like you to talk about your philosophy and approach to leadership, which I know is very important to your position. Absolutely. Um, I would say that all of my experiences, Susan, thus far in my career have prepared me for this. And it is um, important to me to be a good leader. It's important to me to foster the development of other leaders. And um, I suppose if you were to talk to my leadership team across the agency, they could probably tell you a lot more about me as a leader. But I believe in transparency, a transparency. I, I believe in working together to tackle tough challenges. I believe that no one person can take this agency where it needs to go. It really is going to take all of us. And so I've been working very hard to create an environment where people feel empowered to help, you know, direct the future. ARS is an agency that has very, very strong um, cultures, uh, very, very deep beliefs. Um, there are some things that are held very dear inside of this agency. And so as a new person, for me, coming in as an outsider, you know, really taking the time to learn what those things are. And never changing for change's sake. You know, I think that is a mistake. For me, it's important to recognize the rich legacy that we have in this agency, to hold on to those things that are very, very important to this agency, respecting those things, but also leading us to the future. Um, where I envision ARS going, you know, a lot of it's going to require a lot of behavioral changes. You know, there's a lot of change in the way we think about things, change in the way we invest in things. Um, and for me, getting as many people as possible to give us their thoughts and their input on how we move forward. I've spent the last two years, two and a half years listening. We've, we've listened a lot, um, and that's important to me. I want to hear from people. You know, I know that um, there are a lot of people who felt like they didn't have a voice. There are a lot of people who felt that they have no um, mechanism to give the type of feedback that um, would be helpful. But many of the things that I've done since 2014, my, me and my leadership team have done since 2014, resulted from listening sessions, resulted from talking to people who are in it every day who know what things would make a difference. You know, things that wouldn't occur to me here in Washington, D.C., sitting on the mall, but that were critically important to people who are working out in the field or working just over in Beltsville, Maryland. So it's been really important for us to hear from people about their experiences and how we can improve the quality of the experience. We want to be the best place to work, not only in USDA, but in the federal government. And how do we create that? And then we want to be able to deliver the types of science that move the needle, not just here in the United States, but around the world. It's because we have a very important mission in ARS, and it's going to take all of us to help make it happen. Um, science is our mission. We have about 1,800, somewhere between 1,800 and 1,900 scientists. So you think about the 8,000 employees, that means there's a huge infrastructure that supports the scientific mission, and it takes all of us to make it happen. Work and study in the field of bio-based products has changed dramatically. Can you talk about um, some of those changes and how the field has changed American culture? It's interesting because when I joined USDA in 2002, one of the programs that I was responsible for was the bio-based products program. And um, it was just about then that the tension around bioenergy and bio-based products was becoming, you know, it had its, its, its moment in the sun again. You know, it's just like people were thinking about 
what do we do to uh, sustain our environment? What do we do to be responsible, responsible consumers of energy? And so it was a great time to be working in this field. Um, what encourages me is now, some 14 years later, to see the implementation of a lot of the, the ideals and the policies and perspectives that we talked about in 2002. To see ethanol being available in so many places as, a, as an option. To see people being so conscious, socially conscious about recycling, about using renewable resources, about using products that are bio-based. You know, so um, I've seen a lot of growth in that area since 2002 when I joined USDA. And I'm just very encouraged that it's not just the scientists talking about it anymore. It's, it's society talking about how we should be more socially responsible. And um, just seeing where we are is just really uh, an, encouraging, an encouraging fact for me. Now I'd like you to share with us um, a program or a project that taught you something you did not expect. Wow, that's a, um, that's a good one. Let's see, a program or a project that taught me something I didn't expect. Well, I'll tell you, Susan, there are a number of things that um, we do in ARS that surprise me all the time. Um, I had an opportunity to go over and meet with the Department of Defense. Vector-borne diseases, you know, we work a lot in that area in ARS. But to go over to the Department of Defense and then to see how important our research has been to our deployed warfighters that ARS has been responsible for helping to protect our, our men and women in the armed forces for decades. That our research has made the difference for people fighting and protecting this country. So it was just so um, exciting. I don't think I could have been prouder, you know, just to hear how our work has impacted our military. So that's one, that's just one example of an area that we work in that's just, I think more people don't think about it. Um, I would also say we had an opportunity to celebrate the, the um, 75th anniversary of our regional centers, our, our, our centers that really, really focus on products. And to see what they've accomplished over this time is just mind boggling. Uh, some of the awards and the landmark um, recognitions that we've received on some of the work. And knowing that many of those products are integral parts of our lives, you know, and knowing that we were responsible. You know, things like, you know, instant potatoes, which we kind of take for granted today, to find out that it wasn't that simple. <laughs> you know, it's just not that simple. But our scientists were able to figure out a way to make a product that was still palatable. <laughs> still had the right color, still had the right mouth feel, and to be able to create an opportunity for, um, for, for homes to be able to cook those potatoes very quickly, uh, lactose-free milk. You know, for me, um, I'm lactose intolerant, but to be able to enjoy something as simple as a bowl of cereal changes my quality of life and, those of, and that of my children. Um, I think about frozen foods, you know, the technology to create frozen foods originated in our laboratory. Permanent press cotton, hello, I travel all the time. I can't think of a more important <laughs> staple for travelers um, and anybody who doesn't have time to iron. I mean, but those things, people would not connect to ARS. A lot of those things, they'd never connect to us, but that's us. I go to McDonald's and I get the Happy Meal and with the apples, you know, that's us. I'm just so proud of so many of the things that we've done and the differences that we've made for the American people. You are often called on to speak to student groups and to mentor young scientists. Um, I'd like you to talk about some of the experiences in recent years, particularly as you're the administrator of ARS, um, that have been very rewarding to you. For me, growing up, um, having the exposure was critical. It, was, it would have been hard for me to aspire to something I didn't know existed. And so for me, it's really, really, really important to provide that same level of exposure to young people. I want them to know what's possible, and I want them to see someone who's actually doing it. And 
I want them to see that I'm no different than they are. I didn't get here because I'm super special and I have some, you know, some, some special skills that kind of got me here. You know, they too can build my type of uh, background and my type of portfolio and be eligible for this type of job. Um, what I like to share with them um, is persistence, be committed, be confident. You know, those are the types of things I like to share with them. Um, and for me, with the young people, they have so many opportunities now. And I know not everyone we speak to is going to come into the field of agriculture. But if I have an opportunity to raise the awareness to them about agriculture and how important it is to their lives, I think we've created advocates around the United States. And it's very, very important as we try to adopt some of the scientific technologies that we've created. Is there a specific um, project or uh, program that faced very difficult challenges? Perhaps the challenges uh, remain unresolved. If you could um, take the opportunity to explain. There are areas of science that, you know, um, I won't call them challenges, but they certainly aren't easy. Uh, today we have an opportunity to experience a society that's very interested in where their food comes from. People are very, very um, knowledgeable right now. They want to know how is it produced, what does it contain, you know, was it produced in a humane way, you know, around our animal research, how are you treating the animals, how do your processes work, you know. So there are, are a lot of consumers out there who really, really want to know, and they hold us accountable for the work that we do. So it's been really interesting operating in this type of environment as scientists because we've not had this type of attention before. And so we have to learn how to do science in a way now that we have to be responsible and responsive to the community. And that means we need to listen to the community. So it really is an evolution of how do you reach beyond your typical stakeholders, because ARS has lots of stakeholders. We meet with lots of commodity groups and lots of product, product. we meet with lots of commodity groups and lots of, um, ag um, organizations, but how do we reach people who are not involved in the ag industry to make sure that we're communicating with them about ag research? And so it really has evolved into us having to have wider rings of the types of people that we talk to. Because people need to have confidence that we're doing our science in a way that is ethically responsible and that is um, socially responsible. And so I think that that has created an environment for all of us to really have to be better communicators about science. Um, sometimes we believe if we just talk louder, <laughs> if we just give you more facts, you know, you'll just come aboard, you know, and that's just not how it works. And we really have to find ways to really communicate more effectively with our public about the importance of ag research and where we're going and how we're going there. And so that is, it's, I, so I don't call it a challenge, but I call it as an opportunity to really change the way we do things. And then we have parts of our infrastructure, like our collections. Our collections are some, I would like to say they're the best in the world. I'm going to say they're the best in the world. You know, they provide an infrastructure that not only supports the United States, but the 200,000 samples that we share every year travel around the world. We really have been a resource for so many in the agricultural um, scientific community. But those collections aren't very visible, so they're not always, it's not always apparent that they need support. And so those are the types of um, projects or infrastructural needs that we have to continually advocate for support for because they provide a very critical, critical resource for agricultural science. And so I, I really am excited about the opportunities to share data with the world, global open data, and uh, sharing our publications more broadly with, with the world. Um, but it does require us to change the way we do things and the way we communicate. So, it ha so we have to have scientists who are also great communicators outside of the scientific arena. I need to be able to tell our stories succinctly and um, in a way that is clear to the American public why we're important. So, uh, it's, it's just it's an exciting time to be in this area. 
Uh, and now um, one of the more fun questions. Talk about the eagles at the U.S. National Arboretum. <laughs> Our babies. <laughs> Who aren't babies anymore? Who aren't babies anymore? So in 20, 2014, 2015, we noticed that we had a pair of mating eagles in the National Arboretum. And we weren't prepared for this because we had not had eagles in the Arboretum since 1947. And so it sort of caught us all by surprise. And we all wanted to know what is happening in that nest. Are there one, is there one eaglet? Are there two? You know, what are the parents doing? And so we committed that by the next year, if they returned, we would have the cameras in place to be able to have a front row view to what was happening. So working with our partners, the university partners, our, our federal partners, our, our local organizations, we were able to put the cameras in place. And so, long story short, we were able to be able to see the parents prepare. We were able to see the eggs being laid. And we were, be, we were able to see the hatching of the eaglets. And then we watched them grow. And then we were able to watch them fledge. And so it has been an experience that unplanned in terms of the media attention that it received. Um, the last I checked, it was over 50 million hits in over 100 countries. And that was just at the Eagle Naming Contest. So I'm sure, you know, it even it grew. We received the type of media attention for the Arboretum, which was very helpful because most people ask, oh, we have an Arboretum. <laughs> so it was a nice opportunity to really um, educate people about the existence of the Arboretum and the important research that happens there. But the egos really were a galvanizing force for lots and lots of people. And it was just so heartwarming to see so many people who were so interested and who cared so much about those little babies. And um, now that the nest is empty, and uh, there are those of us, the cameras are off, as we uh, await to see if they'll return this year. So um, it's going to be an exciting time. And I'll, I'm ready to watch all over again. Thank you very much. Thank you.